Hi, and welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast, where we talk about images and the people who make them. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of LensRentals.com. Hello, welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. I'm here with Joey Miller. Hello. And we are talking today to photographer, podcaster, author, educator, uh, Rick Salmon. Rick, how are you? Well, I am great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, I love doing this. I love spreading the word about uh, photography, processing, and all this great stuff. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to start with your background. Before we get into what you do now, um, you started as an underwater photographer. Is that right? Well, actually, I started taking pictures, uh, you know, I was about 10 years old. Uh, then I got sidetracked and play. I still play a lot of music, actually. But uh, yeah, for 20 years, that's all I did, uh, underwater photography. Scuba diving took me to all these exotic places like in Indonesia and the Maldives and Fiji. And, you know, the fishes were nice, but the people were awesome. And I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with photographing people. So, you know, that's what I tell people today. That's what I do. I tell people that my specialty is not specializing, however... When it comes down to it, I really do love photographing people the most. How did you get into diving? I used to be the editor of a photography magazine and a photo processing magazine, where I used to have to go to like photo labs, which I didn't like doing. I loved interviewing famous photographers, but I didn't like going to photo labs. So my boss tells me I have to go. This is 1979. My boss tells me I have to go to Dallas, Texas to do a story on a lab. I do the story. The guy likes the story. He calls me up. He says, I really love the story. Again, I didn't want to do it. So anyway, he said, I like the story. He says, oh, by the way, I head up this marine conservation organization, and we need an, uh, an editor for the newsletter. I said, what does it involve? He says, well, you have to learn how to scuba dive and take underwater pictures. Four months later, I'm in Belize, Central America, diving. And then he sent me to four or five more places. And two years later, I was president of the organization. And for 20 years, we went to uh, all these exotic places, again, Costa Rica, Cocos Island, the Galapagos, all throughout Mexico, diving on Spanish shipwrecks, uh, the Red Sea, where we collected fishes for the New York Aquarium, a Great Barrier Reef. I mean, it was amazing. It was totally amazing. It's very fortuitous there. <laughs> that's uh, that's really great. Uh, so you, you were already into writing. Well, I, I figured even way back then, there's like a million photographers. So I encourage your listeners, if you want to increase your chances of getting well-known, <laughs> learn, learn how to write. Diversify as much as possible, right? Well, it's the same thing with your investments, right? If you yeah. have all your yeah. investments in like one stock and it, and it tanks, you're... <laughs> You're not in good shape. It, all I could say is it works for me and it works for a lot of my friends because I think if you're good at one thing, you're good at a lot of different things, right? Like what you learn in flower photography, you could apply to food photography. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of cross- um... Pollination. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cross pollination. Yeah. That, that different field thing brings up an important point. So like we mentioned at the top, you're a photographer, full-time photographer, but also you have a podcast, you're an author, you're an educator. Between all of those different fields you work in, which do you think you like the best? Uh, go through the list again. <laughs> Let's see. Writing, <laughs> teaching, you lead photo tours. Yeah. yeah. yeah it, you're shooting on your own and selling prints. Yeah. Um, well, you know, you know I, I, I imagine they're all rewarding in their own different way. Well, but does any particular one stick out? Well, I'll answer that with what's written on the T-shirt I'm wearing. It depends. <laughs> so in other words, people ask me, what's the best exposure? It depends. You know, if you're photographing a waterfall, right? Do you want to blur the water or freeze the water? Well, it depends. It really depends on like if it's a workshop, if it's a great workshop, everything's going well, you know, that's the best. If I'm uh, writing, you know, that's very therapeutic. There are bad days and good days and good times and bad times, but I would say I wouldn't trade it. That's for sure. I imagine they inform each other. Do you find that teaching photography improves your own photography? Oh, big time. You know, I'm up there, you know, in Iceland or something, you know, pontificating about, okay, here's the best composition and here's this and here's that. And then some young kid shows up <laughs> with like something I didn't even think about. And I said, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I think it's important, very important for photographers to, uh, professional photographers to teach workshop because we can learn from everybody. Well, and you've been to a lot of different places. Uh, what are some of your favorite places you've been to? 
Well, I would say, you know, Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Botswana, these places, these places are totally amazing. But the last few years, I've been going to uh, Antarctica and the High Arctic. And the High Arctic is just starkly beautiful, right? I mean, you have this beautiful ice and the clear sky and the nice water for now. Right. Are you, are you seeing a lot of change over the, over the years? Yes, especially in Iceland. You know, you go to the glaciers and you talk to people and, and they'll agree with you that, you know, these glaciers are receding. Greenland, you better get there fast. I mean, it's melting there faster than anywhere, I think, faster than anywhere else on the planet. Plus, the Gulf Stream is bringing garbage up to Greenland and depositing it on the seafloor in Greenland. So we have to get to some of these places uh, pretty fast. Are there any places you'd like to shoot that you haven't gone to yet? I've been to so many. We, I, uh, we've been to more than 100 countries. And that's a lot. And, you know, people say, well, you want to go to New Zealand. I don't really have any desire to go there. So I think I've, I'll go back to some places that aren't, uh, aren't ruined or overcrowded. Wildlife photography is a particular passion of yours, right? Yes. Uh, you know, you go, that's one of the reasons why I go to Antarctica. You know, the Arctic, it's stark. You're going to see some polar bears, some bears there, but that's about it. You go to Antarctica, you go to a place like South Georgia Island, and you, you're going to have millions and millions and millions of uh, king penguins. You're going to have uh, leopard seals. You're going to have, you know, all different types of birds. So whether you go to Antarctica or uh, to Botswana or South Africa or Kenya, the wildlife there is just um, amazing. But, you know, to get a good wildlife photograph, you need a lot of things, including luck. For wildlife photography, you really want to capture gesture or interaction. You know, a portrait of a lion in Africa, you shoot tight, you can take the same picture at the Bronx Zoo here. It's the gesture. And whether it's a person I'm looking for, I'm photographing, it's the gesture, an animal, it's the gesture. And even the waves. For the slow shutter speed, I'm looking for the gesture of the waves, how they are moving, how they might be caressing a piece of ice or caressing a rock. Gesture is so important in photography. Well, have you ever ever been in any uh, dangerous situations when shooting wildlife? Uh, only once. Not with wildlife photography, but very early on in my career. So we're talking about 35 years ago. I was a novice photographer, right? I'm just getting into it. We're in uh, India. We're in Varanasi. This is where people from all over India go to get cremated and their ashes are sprinkled in the Ganges River and they, you're kind of like guaranteed to go to heaven, right? This is why people go there. We're walking around late at night and, you know, the fires are on the banks of the river. It was beautiful. And I raised my camera to take a picture. Uh, this is with film, right? So I'm shooting at ISO 400, right? Today I'd be shooting at ISO 35,000 or something. <laughs> anyway. I was surrounded. Susan and I, we were surrounded by about 15 people yelling at us, saying we couldn't do this, we shouldn't do it. And our guide talked the, our way out of it. We were lucky. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You know, they're, they're peaceful people, but they could have taken the camera away, you know. Right. And what I learned back then, you really have to respect the subject, you have to respect the, the environment, and you have to respect the situation. That's definitely an important lesson, especially if you're, you know, if you're traveling, if you're not aware of your surroundings. Yeah, that, that's called emotional intelligence. You know, I have a new book out called Phototherapy, Motivation and Wisdom. And I, help, I have a whole chapter in there about emotional intelligence. And what emotional intelligence is, it's about being aware of everything that's going on around, not only being aware of everything that's going on around you, but being aware of your effect on other people. And if we're aware of the effect we have on other people, if we're aware of uh, you know, what's going on around us, this is going to actually help us become a better photographer. We're just not going to be, you know, thinking about the exposure triangle. <laughs> well, it's like what you were talking about with, with wildlife. It's all about the gesture. If you're, if you're not being observant enough to understand what's going on and, and see where it's going to go, you're probably not going to get the shots you want. Exactly. I, I have a fighter pilot friend, Hal Schmidt. And uh, actually, he was a Top Gun pilot, and then he became a Top Gun instructor. And he has a nice talk, a very informative talk about what he learned as a fighter pilot and how it relates to photography. He said that when he's in the cockpit, he has this situational awareness. So he's in the cockpit, his hands on the stick, and he has to be looking all around at all his dials and everything, you know, left, right, up and up and down. 
and he has to be aware of everything. Otherwise, you know, if 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 they're like in a in a in a fight, you know, in the in the air, something bad could happen. If he presses the wrong button, something bad could happen. And it's the same thing with our cameras, right? If we're in a situation and we say, okay, what button does this? What knob does this? You have to be able to do this in the dark. And the only way to get good at this is by doing this every, taking pictures every day. Well, yeah, I think that's a perfect point to take a quick break. And then when we get back, I want to talk some like specific gear questions and uh, maybe get into some technique. Sounds great. Now, Lens Rentals brings you a meditation moment. Close your eyes. Lean back and listen to my voice. You feel yourself getting sleepy. Relax. Drifting on a cloud. You love this podcast. You want to give this podcast a five-star rating. You want to write a positive review of it and even subscribe to it. You know that will bring you a feeling of joy and contentment. When I count to three, you will wake up refreshed and go straight to the review page. One, two, three. Welcome back to the Lens Rentals Podcast. We're here with Rick Salmon, uh, photographer, podcaster, author, uh, educator, and we're going to talk some some gear now. Rick, you mostly shoot Canon, is that right? I exclusively shoot Canon. I've been the Canon Explorer of Light since uh, 2003. And what attracted you to Canon to begin with? This is a very good question <clears throat> and a very interesting story. In 1996, before probably uh, some of your listeners were born, I was using uh, another camera brand. Actually, it was Nikon. See, I shoot on the automatic mode. I shoot on the aperture priority mode because, you know, basically there's only one good exposure and it doesn't really matter how you get there, aperture priority, shutter priority, or manual, right? So fine tuning the exposure with the with your plus and minus controls is key, right? Well, back in 1996, to do this on a Nikon camera, you had to press two buttons, a one button and a wheel. And it slowed me down. And I, I, as you could probably tell, some of your listeners could tell, I'm a little hyper, <laughs> which, is, which is why I could do so much, so why, why I do so many things. Anyway, Canon back then had this wheel on the back of the camera. And until the EOS R, which I'm using exclusively now, you guys rent that, right? We do. Uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is an amazing, for your listeners who are thinking about it, I would definitely recommend renting this camera, checking it out. You guys rent the ring too? The control ring? Oh, we do. Yeah, this, mm -hmm. this is amazing. Anyway, rent that, rent the uh, lens and rent rent the ring so you could use some of your old lenses on it because it's amazing. But anyway, that wheel on the back, and now it's on the control ring and there's also a, a wheel on the back, lets you fine tune the exposure. Let me fine tune the exposure very, very quickly. Also, the autofocus system back then was super fast as it is today. A lot of people say, oh, I'm going to switch to mirrorless. You know, no matter what brand it is, I'm going to switch to mirrorless because it's smaller and lighter. Well, I didn't switch for that reason. I switched because of the electronic viewfinder. Ten years ago, the viewfinders weren't that good. <laughs> oh, they they were terrible. Okay. Really laggy, not kind of grainy. Yeah. Oh, kind of grainy. I I said, I, you know, it's like look at, looking at like you know a cheap TV. I said I am never going to switch. And now the the viewfinders not only are they the image is amazing. The, you can see that, as you know, the histogram, you can see your exposure compensation that I was talking about. You can see your level. You can see all your settings. And because I love people photography, I have my camera set up. So the review is in the viewfinder. So at, when I'm photographing a person, I don't have to take my eye away from the viewfinder mm -hmm. to look at the back of the screen, which they may say, oh, he's distracted or they're going to lose interest. I can keep taking the picture because I can see my results in the in the viewfinder. I love it. Do you have any favorite lenses you're using with it these days? Well, I'm using the uh, 24 to 105, which is unbelievably sharp. This is the one made for the R. And then I just ordered the 15 to 35, 
It might come today, actually, the uh, the 15th. Oh, awesome. The 15th to 35. And I have the adapters. So like when I go to Antarctica, I take my 100 to 400 millimeter lens with the control ring and the 75 to 200, the old L lenses. And, and guess what? Here's something else. You know, people, you know, I go to Antarctica, right? To get to Antarctica, it's like four days because it's like two. You have to leave home. You have to fly to Ushuaia on the bottom of the planet. You got to stay overnight there. So now you're like at two days. And then it's a two day boat ride to get to Antarctica. So this is a pretty remote place. And people say, You're going to Antarctica with a camera with one card slot? Well, I say, Yeah. Since uh, I got into digital in 2001, I've never had a problem with the card. I mean, we used to shoot with a single roll of film in a camera, so uh, and no no interchangeable backs. So well, it's the same thing. Well, uh, do you know what the BLH rule is? What's that? The BLH rule. That, well, I used to shoot slide films, so slide films. So under underwater, you definitely, especially where you are hoping to get one shot, you would use the BLH rule. And the BLH rule is this: bracket like hell, <laughs> because you absolutely. I mean. With Kodachrome, right? And, you know, we're talking oh, yeah. Kodachrome, you know, 64, right? That you could boost, that you could push the ISO 125. You had to bracket like hell to get a good shot. And then they came out with Kodachrome 200. You know, your listeners today, your young listeners who'd never shot film, don't know how lucky they are with their camera and, and with all the imaging, uh, you know, processing software. You also shoot a lot of portraits. Uh, do your lens choices differ for portrait work? Again, it depends. <laughs> there are two types mm -hmm. of portraits. One is like, you know, a head and shoulder shot. But what I really like taking, I like taking what's called the, the environmental portraits, where a picture of the subject is in the environment. So what I do is I like to use, getting back to your question, I either use a 16 to 35 at the wider settings or the 24 to 105 at the wider settings to get these environmental portraits. And mm -hmm. this is the thing. When you're photographing a person, the closer you are to the subject, the more intimate the picture becomes. And when I take these environmental portraits, I'm usually stopping down to get everything in the scene in focus, which is how it looks to my eyes, right? What we have to do as photographers is really think about the story we want to tell. And these environmental portraits really help us tell the story, I think, uh, more so than, you know, just the headshot. Your environmental portraiture goes back to what you were saying earlier about uh, emotional intelligence and being situationally aware. Like you're not only aware of everything going on around your subject, but you're incorporating that into the image because you know it's telling a story. Yes, yes. Yeah, you know, we were in China. We were photographing these uh, cormorant fishermen recently. We was on it. We were, Scott Kelby and I were doing a workshop there, and you know most of the shots. Maybe we were photographing these cormorant fishermen early in the morning. Maybe the cormorant fishermen filled up 10% of the frame because we had these beautiful mountains and the reflection and the sky and the mist. It was just, it was amazing. You know, composition is the key. Edward Weston, famous photographer, black and white photographer, said, you know, composition is the strongest way of seeing. And this is true. And that's why all your listeners should be so happy that they're photographers because they see the world differently. Now, there's a big difference between, you know, looking and seeing. Right. And I think, uh, I think the thing that a lot of photographers miss is the most powerful part of photography is that you are allowed to use all of these tools to present an image that you have crafted that tells what you want it to say. Yes. So, you know, it, by either cropping it or changing your, your, your focal length or whatever you're doing, Anybody could see that scene and see it a million different ways, but you want to show this way that you saw it. Yes. You know, there's an expression, a Freeman Patterson expression. He's a, a Canadian photographer, one of my heroes. He has an expression, and the expression goes like this. The camera looks both ways. In picturing the subject, we're also picturing a part of ourselves, meaning the mood, the feeling, the emotion, you know, the energy that we project, that's going to be reflected in our subjects when we're photographing a person. But I also think the camera looks both ways when it comes to all our photography. You know, I review a lot of portfolios online. And if I look at a portfolio before we get started and the person has like, you know, all landscapes, I think that, hey, maybe that person likes to be alone and go out in nature and just, you know, uh, identify and communicate with nature. If I review a portfolio where a person has a lot of people pictures like me, 
I could tell that they're basically like an extrovert, right? Yeah, and that sort of stuff kind of brings me into your your teaching work. I imagine you work with a lot of beginners. Uh, it depends. Uh, sometimes we have beginners. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, like in, in China, we had some beginners and we had some seasoned pros who were amazing. And they just want to travel. You know, when you go on a workshop, one of the advantages you're working with great guides. And we had great guides in China, Andy and Mia Beals, who got us access not only to the cormorant fishermen, but we went into their homes and we went into these ancient villages. It was just spectacular. And someone just going to China, you know, to this remote area, uh, couldn't get those. So people, we do get a lot of pros on the workshops, but we also get, um, I wouldn't say we get beginners, but we get some novice people. The thing we see the most is people don't know how to use their cameras. They don't know the capabilities of the cameras. And this is really important. My recommendation would be that if you go on a workshop, make sure that you know how to use your camera because the instructor there isn't there to help you find, you know, your self timer or uh, check uh, that you're set up for RAW or whatever. The instructor is there to help you really v- capture in your camera the vision that you see in your mind's eye. Where do you recommend people start? Are are there some good resources or or maybe good introductory gear? What's a good way to kind of make that self-teaching a little easier? Well, I think it starts with the gear. And another thing we see, and I say we, my fellow uh, you know, instructors, that a lot of people buy a camera that's too much for them. It's a lot of people don't need the Canon 1DX Mark II, right? If you're going to photograph birds and sports, you need the Canon 1DX Mark II, right? But if you're going to photograph landscapes, you don't need, you know, that big a camera. It definitely starts with choosing the right camera and really looking at the specifications. Start with the right camera and then don't buy a camera, you know, within like six months before your trip. (laughs) Maybe I'm exaggerating a little, maybe six weeks. You have to know how to use it. You have to practice. And there are plenty of things on YouTube, you know, like out of the box or whatever. And I'm sure you guys have a lot of education. Do people call you up, you know, once they get the camera and they say like on the, oh, on the yeah. EOS R with the ring, hey, the ring's not working or the slider bar is not working. <laughs> oh, constantly. I, I used to do a lot of tech support here. Uh, we have a new team that's all doing it now. But uh, yeah, constant questions about how do I get to this setting? How do I do this setting? Um one advantage of working here is that now I know a lot of that just off the top of my head, but it's taken years. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot, I think one of the big pitfalls for, for a lot of photographers is, especially in the modern age is we, we get into this pitfall of, we want everything instantly. Like we just want to get it and then we want it to work, but we don't really want to take the time to learn something so that we actually know why it's doing. You know, you bring up an excellent point. You know, a lot of kids, uh, a lot of people today were raised on video games, instant gratification, right? Mm-hmm. And and it's different. Absolutely. It's different. The same thing with uh, with music, learning guitar, learning bass, piano, whatever. It's not instant gratification, but it's worth it. A workshop is kind of like taking a guitar or piano lesson. You go to the lesson, you learn something. It may not be that good right away, but you come back in a week to the next lesson and the teacher might say, I can't believe how much you practice. You sound really good. Let's talk about your books. You've made a lot of books over the last uh, 30, 40 years, right? I type fast. <laughs> <laughs> how, what is your process uh, for, for making a book? Like, how do you decide this is what I'm going to do? How do you go about writing it? How do you go about putting it together? Uh, my secret is this, and it's not really a secret. Every book I have is basically pictures and long captions. Now, I see a lot of photography books where... You know, you're reading the book and it says in figure 16.3, which might be three pages later, right? I write so everything fits on a page or a spread. My goal is to make learning easy and fun. I try to make it fun with the writing and I try to make it easy by this type of layout. And the beauty of doing the same writing, a book on landscape photography, then all I have to do if I have a chapter, if I decide later to do a chapter on black and white, all I have to do is, you know, li- copy and paste the picture in the caption. So this picture caption thing sounds very simple, but they're long captions. Sometimes the captions can be, you know, uh, 500 words. As you're producing the images, you're almost writing the book as you go? Well, well, I, I have a basic outline in my mind. One of my uh, books is called Evolution of an Image. And basically, I start with the idea, right? Every picture starts with an idea. 
and then I end up with the with the final picture talking about what I did in Photoshop and Lightroom. So I take the viewer through the through the idea, through the process, through the challenges, whatever. So in that book, I said, okay, I want to do this. I divided into seascapes and landscapes, uh, wildlife, people. Although I'm totally hyper, I'm very organized. I'm very organized, and I think uh, it might be a uh, chemical. <laughs> You know, <laughs> no, it might be. I don't know. I don't know what makes me, you know, I'm not, or it could be whatever, you know, I'm not into those zodiac signs, but I'm sure I'm a Taurus. Do you have any favorites that you, of these books that you've done? Phototherapy, Motivation and Wisdom is my favorite because I feel at this stage in my life, one of my responsibilities is to really motivate and inspire people. And, you know, people say, Rick, you're so lucky, you know, you've been to a hundred countries. You could take a nap every day. <laughs> and go for and go for a walk every day, and you can write books, and they'll do all this stuff. And I say, the harder I work, the luckier I become. And I have worked really, really hard in my life. But this phototherapy book, I'm just so happy that people are um, are liking it because you know I know the stuff that you rent: cameras, lenses, ND filters, lens babies, tripods. We could go through the whole list, right? These can help you make better pictures. For sure, hands down. You're going to go to Iceland, you're going to get a better picture with a better tripod and a, uh, a fixed ND filter rather than a variable ND filter. But all this stuff isn't going to make you a better photographer. And that's what I think this book is going to do. It's going to really help people have that situational awareness. It's going to help them have uh, emotional intelligence. I think if we understand why we take pictures, which is different than understanding how we take pictures. If we understand why we take pictures, like, you know, all those flowers or wildlife, you know, why we take pictures and what your photography means to you. If we understand that, we will definitely become uh, better photographers. Any idea uh, what's next? Do you have any projects lined up that you're excited about? I'm actually working on a phototherapy motivation and wisdom 2.0. And uh, this was such a success. I have, uh, I met some young photographers recently who are amazing. Do you know Ian Plant? Uh, no, he, I don't think he's so. He's in his 40s, like you guys. You know, he's a young guy. And he has a different take on when he photographs landscapes, he's looking for shapes. And I never thought of that. And he gave a great talk on composition. Anyway, he and a bunch of other uh, younger photographers are, are, you know, want to contribute. He talks about composition. Let me ask you guys a question. When it comes to composition, did you ever hear the expression, dead center is deadly? I have, yeah. Right. So it's a composition tip, right? Don't place the subject in the side of the frame, in the center of the frame. Place it off to the side. So here's a great example of when that actually works. And he says, I'm going to show you. And it's actually a picture of the painting of The Last Supper. Like Jesus is right in the middle, right? He's dead center. And there's leading lines in the back. And it's such a great example of why it's so important to break the rules. Right. But you got to know the rules to break the rules. You got to know the rules to break the rules. But again, this, this example of the Last Supper yeah, or a place in the, you know, usually when you're photographing, you know, a horse, a car, a person, you know, running in a frame, you want them running into the frame. You want to have some space into which they can run, right? Well, you know, I've broken that rule with some of my bird photography where I have the subject, you know, almost, you know, kissing the edge of the frame because it creates some tension. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to accuse Leonardo da Vinci of not knowing them. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. No. Well, I, I think that'll about wrap us up. We're going to put some links in the show notes to your book and your website. So if our listeners want to check any of that out, follow the links in the show notes. And Rick, thanks again for coming well, on. Thank you, guys. You guys were uh, our great hosts. Uh, keep up the great work uh, helping people learn about gear and uh, renting gear. So when they go to Africa, they don't want to spend uh, $11,000 on a lens. They could borrow it for a lot uh, less, less cheaper <laughs> from you guys, right? So true. Right. So yeah. true. Yeah. And you, you keep it up too. Thanks again. Thank you, my friends. Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals podcast. If you have any questions or comments, let us know at podcast at lensrentals.com. I'll leave you with this quote by Alfred Eisenstadt. It is more important to click with people than to click the shutter. Shutter.